It's been a few years. <laughs> Um, I'm good to start whenever I have it rolling. Good to start now? Yeah. Okay. Guide to St. Louis. This book is kind of a combination guidebook and kind of brief history. Uh, the publisher wanted us to have places that could actually be visited, so that's the guidebook part. And we wanted to tell some of the history behind those places or the people who were associated with them. And we're going to talk about a few of those tonight. We're going to talk about things, or in the book, you'll find things from the oldest structure in St. Louis, which is the old cathedral downtown to what I, I think is the newest museum in St. Louis, which is the National Blues Museum. At least it's one of the newest, if it's not the newest. In the year 1000, okay, you're looking at that crab nebula? What, what the heck is that got to do with St. Louis? Like, what is this guy, crazy? I thought I came to hear about St. Louis. Oh, there's, there's actually a connection. In the year 1054, there was a huge bright light in the sky that could be seen in the daylight for at least 17 days, and at nighttime for more than two years. That was a supernova. You can still see what's left of the supernova, which is the Crab Nebula, although I think you need some binoculars or a telescope to actually see it. But that year was also the pinnacle of a civilization that grew up across the river from St. Louis, uh, across the Mississippi River, and a civilization we know today as the Mississippians. <coughs> or Cahokia Mounds. The Mississippians uh, began to develop around the year 700. By the year 1054, they had a city of about 15,000 persons, the largest city in North America then, obviously. And there was many, actually several hundred years, before there was another city in North America that actually had a population of 15,000. It was a, a mound city, many mounds. Very large mound here. This is a ceremonial mound with the priests at the top, other mounds scattered throughout 120 mounds altogether in Cahokia Mounds. Uh, they were a prehistoric culture. Prehistoric meaning that they didn't have a written language. And so we don't know what they call the city. We don't know what they call themselves. We call them the Mississippians because they were on the Mississippi 
We call the, the city, or what's left of the city, the remains of Cahokia Mounds, is named after uh, a tribe of Native Americans who lived in the general vicinity, but didn't have any particular connection to, uh, to the people who lived in this city, as far as we know. Uh, since it was a prehistoric uh, culture without writing, what we know about them has to be inferred from what archaeologists can dig up. What's left? The artifacts, the mounds, even trash pits. Uh, just think about if somebody tried to describe our culture a thousand years from now, and they didn't have the computers that worked locally, the paper, the books, whatever, and all they had was our garbage. So that's sort of like what archaeologists have to do. Kind of reminds me of David McCauley's Motel of the Mysteries. Uh, if you're familiar with that book. <clears throat> the city of Cahokia Mounds had uh, 120 mounds. Uh, some of them ceremonial, some of them contained were grave sites. Some of them, they're not sure what they're in because they haven't actually opened them up. About 80 of those mounds survive today. Uh, the others were destroyed after centuries of neglect. Farming on them, building on them, building of interstate highways through the area, but there's some still remain. The most impressive is Monk's Mound, shown here. This is the one that had the uh, has a large uh, temple or, or uh, some sort of ceremonial building on top. Uh, it was three terraces. It bordered on a huge 50-acre Grand Plaza where they apparently had all kinds of meetings, including sporting events uh, called Chunky, where they, they rolled a, a stone stone across and some guy threw a spear at it. I, I don't know, I, I can't explain it, but it's, you know, it's, it's as crazy to me as footage. But anyway, uh, this is Monk's Mound today. The Monk's Mound is uh, 1,040 feet long. It's 790 feet wide. It's 100 feet tall. It has three terraces. It has two, 22 million cubic feet of soil. And apparently it was built by hand, carried in baskets, 14 million of them, to help build this thing. Now, the fact that the inhabitants didn't have a written language doesn't mean that they didn't have a complex civilization. The Mississippians, the inhabitants of Cahokia Mounds, had a very complex civilization based on what we're able to determine from the artifacts and other things that have been left behind. They have well-defined social classes. They had elaborate rituals, maybe even human sacrifice. They were skilled astronomers. Uh, archaeologists discovered the remains of some circles, and it turned out that there were these poles that had been located in them, and they were used in order to uh, uh, mark celestial events equinox or solstice. In fact, the park service over there even holds events today these days where you want to get up and get over there to sunrise, you can, uh, you can kind of get the idea of what they were doing with these things because they reproduced uh, one of these circles. Uh, the residents of Cahokia Mound seem to have been warlike, or at least <coughs> enemies, that they built stockades and built guard towers around, around the place. But at some point, they may have reached uh, peace with the surrounding tribes because archaeologists found in one spot over a hundred axe, axes. They were all there together, all excavated at one time. And uh, they were all together. These were described by the archaeology magazine as a cold hard cache of uh, axes uh, that may have uh, symbolically and in actuality have represented burying the hatchet. Cahokia Mounds inhabitants, the city disappeared around 1300. We don't know why. Uh, was there a, some disease that swept through the place? Was there a famine? Had they run out of natural resources and they all had to move? We don't really know the answer even today. There have been various speculations and theories about it. None of them have been able to satisfactorily answer what happened to the place. Cahokia Mounds, however, wasn't the only place in the area that had mounds. East St. Louis had 26 mounds. Forest Park had 16 mounds, the last of which were destroyed when the 1904 World's Fair was constructed. The city of St. Louis itself had 45 mounds, 
and was known throughout much of the 19th century as the Mound City because of that. Its last mound was the Big Mound, which was dismantled and destroyed uh, shortly after the Civil War. And whatever was inside of it apparently wasn't saved, so we don't know what was there. Today, all that's left is this uh, monument near the Stan Span, the Stan Beastable Bridge across the Mississippi River. There is a surviving mound left in St. Louis, that Sugarloaf Mound down in South St. Louis. It's now owned and uh, preserved by the Osage Nation, who count the Mississippians among their ancestors. Now, I've spoken of mounds and many mounds, many of them which were used as grave sites. And now Vicky's going to talk about a bit more modern place that has grave sites. The one on the right. All right. <clears throat> I think, and when I was researching this, can you guys can hear me without me using this? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, when I was researching this book, the one place I found where you could really find out a lot about St. Louis history is Bell Fountain Cemetery. First of all, I had no idea how interesting it was going to be. It is a fascinating place and probably my favorite place of all the places that we discovered when we were researching this book. Um, next door to Belfontaine mm -hmm. is also Belfontaine, which they that is the correct way to pronounce it. It's not Belfontaine, it's Belfontaine. Um, it's Calvary Cemetery, which just expands the level of what you can find out about St. Paul's history uh, in that. So, after the cholera epidemic, it wasn't just one epidemic, there was one epidemic after another, after another. The cemeteries within the city of St. Louis were just about filled up because so many people had died. And at that time, St. Louis decreed that there could be no more cemeteries, no more people buried within the city limits because they had the mistaken belief that the disease could somehow leach out of the graves and infect people. Of course, that was wrong, but they did it anyway. Um, so to make room for the expanding city, and uh, sometimes bodies had to be dug up. And they were reburied in different places, and eventually they came to rest in Belfontaine Fontaine and Calvary. At the same time across the country, there was this movement of what they called garden cemeteries. And what they would do is they would find some nice, peaceful place out in the country and decide that was the right place for people to be buried. Um, the, most, the most famous one of these is Green Cemetery in New York City, and that's what Belfontaine is kind of modeled after. They wanted it to be more than just a cemetery. It was also to be a showcase for architecture. It would be educational. You would come there to find out about history. And it was also to be a horticultural center. And that is something that has continued to this day. <coughs> um, it was the first garden cemetery west of the Mississippi River, which a lot of things in St. Louis are the first west of the Mississippi River. There's 314 acres in Belfontaine, Calvary is bigger. Um, when it was originally bought and laid out, there were only 138 acres, <coughs> and that was in 1850. So right now, they tell me that it's only half full, and there should be space for burials for the next 200 years, which kind of amazes me, but that's the way it is. Now, today, it's a level two arboretum. There's 9,000 trees because they take good care of them and they're constantly replanting. And they have 5,000 different varieties. There's 87,000 people buried there. And many of the gravestones themselves are architecturally significant. For example, Louis Sullivan, who built the Wainwright Building in downtown St. Louis, also designed the Wainwright tomb that's in Belfort 
Okay. Now, the interesting thing is who is buried in the cemetery? And they did a lot of research to keep up with who's there. And they tried to have story for every single person that is there. And that's one of the things that volunteers do in the cemetery. Okay, William Clark of the Lewis and Clark Expedition was buried in the Montaigne. David R. Francis, who was president of the Louisiana Purchase Expedition, he was also governor of the state of Missouri, he was also mayor of St. Louis. Sarah Teasdale, she was the first Pulitzer Prize winning poet. Susan Blow, she opened the first kindergarten. Uh, Adolphus Bush, this is his mausoleum right here, the Bush family mausoleum. When it was built, when uh, Mr. Bush died, it cost $250,000. If something happened to destroy that mausoleum today, it would cost $7.5 million to replace it. Um, you can't see it because I took this picture of not that great, and, but the, the wire door that is across the opening has vines, and those vines represent Mr. Bush's favorite drink, which happened to be wine. <laughs> um, the Lemp family, which was another big beer family in St. Louis, they uh, have the largest mausoleum in, in the cemetery. Okay, Samuel Gaddy. If anybody's ever been to one of our steamboat talks, Jim talks a lot about Samuel Gaddy. He was a person, there's a lot of steamboat captains buried in the cemetery. He wasn't a steamboat captain. He was a manufacturer of steamboat parts. But the reason I wanted to show you this, one of the things I asked when, when I was there visiting, I said, you know, they were talking about all the stuff that was um, was hewn into the different different stones. And it wasn't like, I write books, and so there's a pin, you know, there. It wasn't about what they did with their life, except for Samuel Gaddy. It's, it's um, hard to see. But all around his grave, you can see these little markers, which you kind of think initially that they might be family members. And there are family members that are buried with him, you know, in the same plot as he is. Um, but these tell his life story. Each one of them has a different thing about his life story. The other kind of interesting thing about his, and I don't know if you can see this either, but after his name, G-A-T-Y, there's a little period and what they would do is if you were the patriarch of the family and you had no male heirs to carry on your family name, they put a period on your name. What is that? Wow. Was this, you know, wow. it didn't matter that you had seven daughters, <laughs> you know, if you didn't have one son, that was, that was all there was to it. Another famous steamboat captain, which you would have also heard about in Jim's talks, is a man named William Massey. Well, one thing William Massey did was he wrecked the Steamboat Montana at the St. Charles Railroad Bridge. But the other thing he did was he was president of the poker game when Wild Bill, Wild Bill Hickok Hickok. Was, was shot. And the bullet passed through Wild Bill Hickok and ended up in Bill Massey's wrist. Now, he never had that bullet removed. And when he would come to some town, he would yell, the bullet that killed Wild Bill Hickok is here in town. <laughs> well, it is also buried in Belfontaine. <laughs> <laughs> so, now 15% of the graves in Belfontaine are unmarked. And there's a variety of reasons for that. For example, there is the unmarked grave of a woman named Eliza Haycraft. Uh, uh, Miss Haycraft was a woman of the night. And the thing is, she made tons of money, and when she died, she wanted to be married, buried in Belfontaine. And the trustees said, yes, she can be buried there, but <coughs> she can't have a marker for her grave. So she has a huge plot underneath a sweet gum tree at the top of a hill, and that's where she rests. She did donate lots of money to help other people. Um, a lot of wealthy African Americans would not have marked graves. And the reason they wouldn't is because that would tell 
people that they were wealthy and they had money and they didn't want their families to be bothered about that. Now, there's a lot of reasons. Some of the graves in the cemetery, even though it didn't <coughs> 1850, date back to 1817 because there was a small family cemetery there. So there's some very old graves. This grave is the grave of Kate Brinton Bennett. Now, Kate was known as the most beautiful woman in St. Louis when she was alive. But unfortunately, that also caused her death. One of the things that was very popular in that day was to have very, very white skin. And the way women got that white skin was to use arsenic. Mm -hmm. Well, a little bit of arsenic will kill you, mm -hmm. but over time, it builds up in your body. And that is what eventually led to her demise. And so this, he built a beautiful, her husband built a beautiful, beautiful monument to um, memorialize her as the most beautiful woman. And then, this was another story they told us. There was a woman named Oma Vaughn. And at one point in her life, she had to have her leg amputated. Well, she wanted to be reunited with that leg after she died so she could walk through the gates of heaven on two legs. So they buried that leg in Mount Fontaine Cemetery. Unfortunately, she moved away from St. Louis and ended up here somewhere else without her leg. <laughs> so there's tours <coughs> here, and some of the tours are you know, are kind of uh, like there's a beer barracks tour and there's a steamboat captain tour, you know, different things like that. And uh, you can also just arrange tours. The one I took was, a, one of them was about iconography. And so that was really, like there's a whole plot that's just wood, modern women, which was a paternal organization. And so they all have a certain kind of icon, you know, on their, on their graves. Now, Calgary, which I don't have any pictures of. I tried to get some, but I just couldn't get them to download. They opened in 1854, and they are um, under the auspices of the St. Louis Catholic Diocese. It's big, 470 acres. There's 300,000 graves there already, and 20% of those are religious, like priests and nuns and, and others, you know, in, in religious orders. But some of the people, that you might be familiar with that are buried there. Uh, if you've ever watched The Wizard of Oz and seen the munchkins, there was a very famous munchkin named Mickey Carroll that lived here in St. Louis, and Mickey Carroll is, is buried in Calvary Cemetery. August Choteau, one of the founders of St. Louis, when they cleared all the land and closed down the cemetery by the old cathedral, he was reinterred at uh, Calvary, as was Madame uh, Marie Chateau. Dred Scott, Jim's going to talk about Dred Scott. I think, no, he's not. Never mind. But you know Dred Scott. <laughs> yeah. But Dred Scott, you know who he was. He had a very famous uh, <coughs> legal case seeking his freedom. He was a slave. Tennessee Williams, even though he allegedly was not very crazy about St. Louis, he wanted to be. Uh, there, when the archdiocese bought the land where Calvary Cemetery is now, they used half of it for a cemetery, and um, Kendrick was, was the cardinal then, and he built a house and lived out there for the other half. But there were also graves already there, like there were at Mount Fontaine. Uh, there were soldiers from Mount Fontaine, well, I don't know how they said Mount Fontaine before, they might have and it built fountain instead of built on tape for it. And there were some Native Americans. And so they dug them all up, reburied them in a mass grave, and it's marked by a cross there. Uh, one of the things that I found really interesting was that uh, Bill Fontaine works with the surrounding neighborhood. And one of the things that they've done, this is kind of a sad thing because it shows you how, how much maternal health care needs to be improved in St. Louis. They have a project that they call their angel cemetery, where they bury uh, children who wouldn't otherwise have the money to be buried. Well, they've already filled up one of their angel cemeteries, and they had to open a second one. So, you know, they do lots of um, different things there. Um, and I hope you'll 
your long term chance in your years that we have. So, like, oh, oh, in the olden days, they used to have picnics there on Sunday afternoon. People would drive in their carriages out and they would picnic, you know, around the grounds of the cemetery. So, but they do encourage you to come and walk around, not so much. So, Jim, we've been talking the saying is that you can uh, follow the history of the Civil War by going to Bellefontaine Cemetery and uh, Calvary Cemetery. There are some places, St. Louis was a, a center for the Civil War, and there are still a few places left standing that were here at the time of the Civil War. I'm going to talk about one of them. In 1843, General <coughs> Lieutenant arrived at Jefferson Barracks as his first posting in the Army. His friend and West Point roommate, Frederick Dent Jr., invited him to the family home at nearby Whitehaven. There, the young lieutenant was smitten by Frederick Dent Jr.'s sister. They courted for several years and were married in 1848. The young lieutenant, of course, was Ulysses Grant, and his sister was Julia Dent. Julia Dent Grant. Julia lived at Whitehaven. She grew up in Whitehaven uh, and lived there for a number of years while Ulysses was away at the Army, first fighting in the Mexican War and later in distant postings. Ulysses left the Army in 1854 and went to live with Julia and her parents and their children at Whitehaven. They lived there for much of the 1850s. This is White Haven in 1860, pictured on the left. This is White Haven today. Uh, one of the things that many people ask for the first time they come to White Haven, they ask the rangers, I've been told, they walk out to the door of the uh, visitor center and they say, there's White Haven, and they say, well, why is it green? <laughs> well, White Haven is not the name of the house. White Haven is the name of the place. Frederick Dent's ancestors had a plantation in Maryland, uh, which was called Whitehaven. When Frederick Dent Sr. moved to St. Louis and bought what is Whitehaven, he decided he would call his place Whitehaven, eventually acquiring land and had 850 acres. Uh, when the National Park Service acquired the property in 1989, they were rehabilitating the house and they were looking for a door there was only one door in that house that was in which the enslaved persons were allowed to enter the house. And it had been covered up in recent times, and they were looking for it. And when they stripped off this part of the uh, building, they saw a uh, the painting that painted what was the, the exterior of the, of the house, as it was when the Grants owned it after the Civil War. And it was Paris Green. Paris Green was a very popular color in the Victorian, Victorian era. And so the uh, National Park Service decided they would paint the entire house Paris green because that's the way it appeared when the Grants owned it after the Civil War. <clears throat> Frederick uh, Dent Sr. had uh, a number of slaves, maybe as many as 20 or 30. Uh, some may have lived in a stone building that was built behind the house that was also used as a summer kitchen. The rest probably lived in cabins. Uh, behind, up the hill and across, uh, across the creek from it uh, in uh, suburban subdivision, yeah, where we live these days. Uh, the uh, crops were grown on what's now the parking lot for Grant's Farm and the uh, pasture where the Clydesdales roamed. Uh, there also was a chicken house built that's there. Uh, Julia Dent, uh, really liked chickens. Uh, probably she didn't take care of them. Probably the uh, slaves who lived there took care of them, but she did like chickens. And there's an ice house. Uh, Grant was an avid horseman, and after the war he had a stable built uh, to keep his horses, although they didn't end up living there. Uh, that stable is now the museum for the uh, Ulysses Grant historic site. Uh, the Grants last visited Whitehaven in 1883. Uh, the building uh, and the area, the, the farm became, uh, went into private hands and was owned privately until 1986 when it was acquired by St. Louis County and then uh, it was sold to the federal government and National Park Service in 1989. 
Now there's another building that's associated with the grants that are still around uh, that's probably at least as famous as Whitehaven, if not more famous. And that's Hard Scrabble. Hard Scrabble was built by Grant himself over several months uh, with the assistance of uh, slaves and neighbors. It was on a property of about 80 acres or so that was given to him by uh, Frederick uh, Dent Sr. Hard Scrabble originally was located in what is now St. Paul Cemetery on Rock Hill Road, and there's a small monument there. It was placed there in uh, 1946 by the VAR. But Hard Scrabble itself has quite a, quite a history. Uh, the Grants only lived there about three months after it was completed. Uh, Julia's mother died, and they decided to move back into Whitehaven and uh, take care and live with uh, Frederick Dent Sr. After the, well, uh, during the war, uh, well, before, I'm sorry, just before the war, the Grants moved down into the city to, to a house in 1008 Benton, apartment, which I think is still there. Uh, and what they did was uh, they traded properties. A guy named Joseph White owned it, so they gave him hard scrabble, they got the house. But since hard scrabble was added 80 acres of farm with it, it was worth more than just the house in the city. So uh, he also gave them a promissory note for $3,000. Well, White defaulted on the promissory note, and it was a foreclosure sale. Grant was away in 1864, I guess it was. You know, he had some other things to do at the time. He couldn't come back for that foreclosure sale. So he asked Julia to buy it out of foreclosure, which she did. Uh, but she took pity on Mr. White and said, well, you can still live there, and you just lease it from me. Well, after the war, there arose a dispute between White and Julia as to ownership and title to this property. It went to court. Uh, White claimed that Julia, as a married woman, was not allowed to own any property in her own name in Missouri. But that all got rejected. She won in the Missouri Supreme Court, and the Grants got the property back, clear title. Well, in the 1880s, uh, as you know, uh, Grant had some financial problems. He ended up borrowing money from one of the Vanderbilts, gave him a mortgage on the property for $150,000. Grant went bust when his uh, business partner uh, cheated him out of uh, all of his money and uh, he ended up losing the property. Property went into other hands, exchanged hands a couple of times. Some real estate guys from uh, Webster Groves bought hard scrabble. They disassembled it carefully numbered each piece and reassembled it over in the old orchard section of Webster Groves, where it was there for several years. It was purchased by a guy named C.F. Blanke, so Blank, B-L-A-N-K-E, in 1903. And he had it reassembled at the World's Fair, next to what is now the St. Louis Art Museum. And he used it as an advertisement for his products, which were, I think, coffee and tea. Uh, but he couldn't keep it there. The city wouldn't let him keep it there. It ended up being sold to August Bush, and it was moved to its present location in Grants Farm, where you can go see it on the tour, or if you're driving by on Grand Road, you can see it. It's now time for Vicki to come back and tell you something about. The Missouri History Museum is a is a place that kind of holds a uh, place in our heart because we <coughs> work, we've done a lot of work down there and um, we like it a lot. After the Civil War, St. Louis leaders realized that a lot of St. Louis and Missouri history was just kind of disappearing and going away. And so they got together and they formed the Missouri Historical Society. At first, they met in people's homes. And would be like we invited all of you guys over and we stood up here and talked to you. That's the kind of things that they would do. But they started collecting artifacts and ephemera, and it got to be so much they needed a place to put it. So a mansion down in the city, Tom, the Thomas Lincoln Mansion, came for sale. And so they bought it and opened up a museum. But you had to be a member. You couldn't just go in and see it. You had to be a member. And by this time, they decided to kind of focus on St. Louis history. And I think you'll notice if you go to the Missouri History Museum that it does focus very strongly on just St. Louis history. 
Um, but then people started to not be members anymore. And they started having money problems. So they opened it to the public and um, charged admission. So then came the World's Fair and the Louisiana Purchase Exposition. And many of the people that were in charge of the uh, Louisiana Purchase Exposition also were involved with the History Museum. Amazingly, there was a profit made from the 1904 World's Fair. And so these leaders said, well, what we need to do is build the History Museum and make it a monument to Thomas Jefferson. So they built the History Museum. And as some of you who've been around for a while might know, the where the big columns are, that was an open car courtyard for a long time, and that's where the Thomas Jefferson statue was. It's all been enclosed now. And they built onto the museum and opened a south entrance in 2000. So that's what it looks like from the south end and then the old part is the North End. Uh, 230,000 people came when the museum opened in 1913. That's a lot of people. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we kind of focused on in this book were that people really make the history of St. Louis. Well, there's a person at the Missouri History Museum that kind of is, is a character that um, I wanted to talk about. There is a typo in the book that is driving me crazy. And it was my fault because we proofread that book a thousand times. It's her name is Miss Nettie, not Miss Letty. And even when I was making these notes, I wrote Miss Letty. So you can just see that it's stuck in my head. But anyways, Miss Nettie Beauregard was the first archivist at the Missouri History Museum. And her assistant was the librarian, and her name was Stella Drum. And they did most of the jobs that it takes, you know, <laughs> hundreds of people to do today. They would do everything from reading the guests to collecting the artifacts to cataloging the artifacts to, you know, the whole, they did, they did it all. I'm sure they had some help, but it was mostly them. Um, she was somebody to be reckoned with. For example, she was fairly from a socially prominent family. And everybody wanted the William Clark collection, the head of the Lewis and Clark expedition. And it was under the control of his granddaughter, Julia Clark Forbes. Now, Miss Forbes was just really tired of everybody coming and knocking on the door trying to get all of these things that belonged to her grandfather. So instead of approaching her as the archivist for the Missouri Historical Society, she approached her from a social state because they were social equals. And she had a tea and invited Mrs. Forbes to her tea. And after a while, they became friends. And after a little while longer, she convinced her to donate the William Clark collection to the Missouri Historical Society. She also made a personal connection with Charles Lindbergh um, and had him make a promise before he even made the successful fly across the Atlantic Ocean, that he would donate all of his awards and trophies and all of the you know, things that he got as a result of making a successful fly like that to the Missouri Historical Society. Now, there was more to it than that. A lot of the people that financed his, his fly, the Spirit of St. Louis, were from St. Louis. And um, a lot of those men were also legally involved with Missouri Historical Society. Here's a picture of Miss Letty. Miss Nettie, good grief, I'm never going to get that right. Miss Nettie is the one on the on the, your left, Charles Lindbergh and Marl Lindbergh. And she wasn't identified, but I bet you anything that's Stella Drum on the right. So she acquired even more donations. I mean, recently they had a, an exhibit at the museum that was a wedding gift that uh, the ambassador from Mexico, and it was this huge painting. Uh, Flores Flores um, that they gave to the Lindberghs that they also donated. So it was, you know, she was one of those people. Now, there is a rumor amongst the staff at the Missouri Historical Society that Miss Nettie has stayed behind even after she's died and she haunts the old offices. If you've ever been to those old offices, 
They have a lot of character, but they're very spooky. And when they hear sounds coming from there at night, they figure it's Miss Ned and Chuck and I. I'm going to hold them for two. <laughs> so today, there's actually three cards to the Missouri Historical Society. I'm just going to go through it real quick. This is the reading room at the Missouri Historical Society Library. It was at one time the uh, United Hebrew Congregation, and um, Martin Luther King Jr. made a very important speech there. And this is Soldier's Memorial, which is downtown, and it is to honor all St. Louis men and women from the whole metropolitan area that served in the United States uh, service. So. And before I forget, thank you, Left Hand Books, for arranging all of this. So we really appreciate you doing that. Henry Shaw is another important state Louisan who also had a hand in forming the Missouri History Museum. And you know Shaw's Garden, our, what we, a lot of us that have been around for a while, call it Missouri Botanical Garden. But it really was Shaw's personal garden for a long time. This, of course, is the uh, Imatron. Now, Henry Shaw kind of took a roundabout route to get to St. Louis. He and his father came from England. His father made a very bad business deal, owed a whole lot of money. And so uh, Henry went down to New Orleans to try to salvage what he could from some of the merchandise that they were supposed, was supposed to be sold for him, but his partner you know, tried to steal it. Well, he brought that merchandise up to St. Louis at a time when there was a huge demand for hardware and tools, and there wasn't very much of a supply. So he um, just was at the right place at the right time. And he didn't just set up a hardware dynasty, although he made a lot of money there. He also <coughs> diversified into banking and into real estate. And he bought real estate both inside the city outside the city because he loved the open air. Um, he was made enough money that he retired when he was 39 years old. And he traveled widely and he got very into European gardens. And so he decided that's what he wanted to do when he came to <coughs> St. Louis. But he didn't just want like a pretty garden. He consulted some experts and they decided that they would make it what they called a, quote, zoo for plants. And um, it also would have a research element and a library and a museum and all kinds of things like that. <coughs> and it was 60,000 specimens at the beginning. Now there's over 5 million and 120,000 volumes in the library. He left all of this, of course, to the St. Louis people. But that almost didn't happen. Uh, when he was 60 years old, he was walking out in his garden one day, and he met this young lady whose name was Effie. Now, he and Effie became friends, and Effie would borrow money from him from time to time, and he eventually lent, rented her a piano for a dollar a month. After a while, he took the piano back on the pretext that he needed it for a party he was having at his house, and then he kind of cut off all communication with her. <coughs> well, she thought, well, maybe he's sick. He's not answering any of my calls or letters or anything. So she went to his house to visit him, and of course, he was just trying to get rid of her. Well, she sued him for breach of promise and claimed that when she came to his house to see about his health, he made an indecent proposal to her. And she sued him for $100,000, which was a massive amount in that you know, at that time, in 1856. And the court awarded her the entire amount. They came out in her favor and awarded her $100,000. Well, that would have been it for the botanical gardens if he hadn't uh, taken the case to a higher court. At that point, the only thing he felt like he could do was attack Miss Effie's character. And he said she'd been the one to act badly and to make bad suggestions. She had sued in the past other men for breach of promise. And that she'd only befriended Mr. Shaw so that she could take advantage of him. 
and she also acted badly in church. And what she did was she smiled during the sermon. So they, of course, had to decide for Henry Shaw at that point. I mean, if you're going to smile during the sermon, that's just horrible. And he got, he was removed of having to pay that debt. And so, you know, we now today have the Botanical Gardens. He also founded the School of Botany at Washington University, and he also gave St. Louis City Tower Road Park. So he's somebody that we have a lot to thank. That is a lot. Mm -hmm. And there's his house. Oh, there's his house. <laughs> and actually, it's built, it was built on to after he died because the next director of the garden, uh, whose name was Trelise, had children and he had to expand it so there would be room for the children. So the wing, the big wing you see. 1904 World's Fair brought the world to St. Louis. The civics leaders decided that the people of St. Louis need to learn more about itself and its history. And so in 1914, they put on the pageant and mask of St. Louis. <coughs> they built a stage, it was 800 feet wide, 200 feet deep at the foot of Art Hill. And 7,700 actors portrayed the history of the region and scenes that depicted the mound builders at Cahokia Mounds, Revolutionary War attack on St. Louis, transfer of Louisiana territory from France to the United States, Lewis and Clark Expedition, Senator Thomas Hart Benton in the Civil War, Essentially, the first 114 pages of our book. <laughs> Over a period of four or five nights, 455,000 persons attended and saw the performance. An unexpected profit from the performance uh, was used for a far less ambitious production of Shakespeare's As You Like It in 1916 uh, at a place that was precursor to what became the Municipal Theater of St. Louis, or that which we know today as the Muni. The community opened in 1919 with a production of Robin Hood, shown here. One of the people who was attending that night opening was Christian Ludolf Ebsen. Uh, unfortunately, he used his stage name Buddy Ebsen when he went into the show business. And uh, for those of you who are old enough, like me, I remember him as being a Davy Crockett sidekick in the Disney series, along with Fess Parker. Uh, but he was, of course, the most famous as Jack Clampett. You know, poor Mountaineer barely kept his family fed. One day he was that's well, you know how the song goes. <laughs> anyway, uh, there were many other uh, famous actors who actually appeared at the Muni. Uh, one of them, shown here, was in The Three Musketeers in July 1931, when he left suddenly because he got an, uh, a deal to go up here in a movie, movies in uh, Los Angeles. He left behind his trunk. Uh, we've had the initials AL stamped on it, which you probably didn't need anymore because he became a movie star known as Cary Grant. Cary Grant, 1931. There were other stars that appeared at Muni, and I'll name a few, but there are dozens more that you could name. I'll just give you a few that uh, you could pick out. Ethel Merman, Debbie Reynolds, Pearl Bailey, Bob Hope, Warren McCall, John Travolta, of all people, Ken Page, Carol Channing, Phyllis Diller, Angela Lansbury. And a tradition of the Muni from the beginning was and still is that there are free seats in the back pew, three or four rows. Available on a first come, first serve basis. Now we've described tonight a few of the places and the history behind them that are in the book. Uh, St. Louis has such a rich history, we couldn't cover them all tonight. We can't even cover them all in the book. We had to be selective. We have learned a lot about the city and the region uh, that we didn't know before and researching it and visiting these spots, even though we've lived here for nearly 40 years. Uh, we hope you'll be encouraged to visit these places we've written about. And as the civic leader said in 1914, learn about the history of our city and our region. Now, we may not be able to reach 455,000 readers as they reached in 1914 with their performance, but like to start. <laughs> we got to crowd. We'll be happy to answer any questions you have, and if we can't, we'll take it or try to find some place where you can't find the answer. You have a library after that. So, any questions? Oh, 
we answered them all already. <laughs> Incredible. Well, 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 yes. This may be too down in the weeds. No, I, 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 I have a leader. We're talking about the container from the garden. It made me think about, and you said it was given to the city at some point, or, or it's, because I think of the Zoo Museum District that covers the expenses, and so we don't pay entrance to certain museums in the zoo. Yeah, but it's not part of that. No, it's a charitable, it's a charitable corporation. So it's not, yeah. So it, it's it's operated by its own board, and, so and it's had ups and downs, and there's been times when it's been threatened that it might not survive. But yeah, but it wasn't managed. ever owned by the city. Right? It no. Well, was, it was uh, given to the city, but it's operated now as a city. Yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of like the Soldiers Memorial, which is owned <laughs> by the city, but operated by the Missouri Historical Society. Town so, so is owned by the city, however. Yeah. It is run different than any other part of the city, but it is it has its own board of directors, but it is owned by the city. Other questions? Please feel free. Well, all right, then thank you very much. Thank you for coming back. Thanks again for coming.